uh, moved by uh, myself and um, seconded by Councillor Henderson. So um, that item is now on the table uh, for discussion. And I know that uh, everybody's read that particular item. Before we, um, we, we start, Dave and Neil, I just want to acknowledge uh, Chairperson Margaret Miles from the Upper Harbour Local Board. She's, she sent a, um, an email saying, one, uh, that she uh, couldn't make this particular meeting to support uh, the rowing um, in her area as per this item. Um, so I just wanted to get her acknowledgement in there. So tēnā kōrua, um, and I'll just hand it over to you both. Kia ora Thank you, Dave and Neil. Kia ora uh, My name's Neil Coventry. I'm the team leader for Sport and Recreation. Um, Okay, so the purpose today is to approve the allocation of the 2020-2021 Sport and Rec Facility Investment Fund. Uh, this is a contestable fund that supports the development of regional and sub-regional sport and recreation facilities across Auckland. <coughs> Key objectives of the fund are to address facility shortfalls, uh, allow council to proactively respond to changing sport and rec preferences, and to partner with community and other funders to enable more Aucklanders to to get active more often. Uh, decision making with the, of this fund sits with the PACE committee uh, with 120 million budgeted through the long-term plan. Uh, following adoption of the emergency budget, funding is phased as shown below in the, in the presentation above, <laughs> uh, with 6.5 million available in uh, this first contestable round. Um, so, in terms of the investment principles for this for this fund, um, this year, as I said, there's the first contestable round uh, with assessment criteria based on the sport investment plan that was adopted in 2019. Uh, the sport investment plan guides council's investment into sport and recreation and is driven by four principles. The weighting of each principle is reflective of ensuring a more targeted approach to funding allocation. These principles and the approach to project assessment uh, was workshop with the committee back in March of this year. Uh, the first and most significant principle in terms of weighting is equity. So that looks to ensure outcomes regardless of age, gender, ethnicity, socioeconomic status or location. Uh, second principle is about being outcome focused and ensuring clear line of sight um, between the investment and the outcomes that it delivers. Third is around financial sustainability and ensuring this balance between being able to maintain and run facilities, uh, but at a level that doesn't price out um, the community from access. And the fourth principle is about accountability and ensuring investment is effective, transparent and consistent. Um, in addition to those four core uh, sport investment principles, two other lenses we used um, to assess projects as they specifically relate to um, facility development. The first was about ensuring the facility is fit for purpose and flexible to meet future needs, so meets perhaps meets design standards of a, for a building. Second, um, that became even more important following COVID-19 was deliverability or, or achievability. Um, so that's really about having a realistic funding plan. Um, so in terms of the timetable, firstly, the fund was, um, was advertised through Regional Sports Trust Network. Um, it, that includes over 1,700 sports clubs and over 200 regional and national sports organisations, as well as being adv advertised through council and local board social media channels. Um, the contestable fund comprised a two-stage application process, the first of which was a one-page um, canvas. Uh, that help groups flesh out the key elements of their project. So that was things like network gaps, community need, the target users, uh, the location of the facility, who their partners were going to be, uh, the time frame to deliver their project, and um, the funding that would be required to deliver it. Uh, the sport and recreation team, and in some cases, um, the regional sport, sports trust, um, uh, spaces and places team, they sat down with uh, groups to help them work through that canvas, or we provided email uh, feedback um, once they sent it through. So from initial inquiries, 59 expressions of interest were received. 
And after reviewing those 59 expressions of interest um, the, um, against the criteria for the fund, 21 proceeded to stage two. Uh, within the 38 projects that didn't move forward to stage two, there was a mix of reasons as to why. Um, they included that the project wasn't viable. So, so one example would be there's, there's a water sports proposal that was looking to use Rosedale Pond 2, um, which um, I think they would have come out a little bit worse away. Um, some other projects um, didn't have a clear sport and rec, uh, a, a clear sport and recreation regional outcome. So there was, for instance, like a men's shed project. Um, some projects had already been allocated funding through other council sources, e.g. surf life saving. Um, in other cases, groups were redirected to other council funding streams, particularly if the project had a more local focus than a regional or sub-regional focus. Um, so they were uh, directed towards local board community grants or doing deputations to, to, to advocate for LDI funding. Or in some cases, some local boards have targeted um, sport and recreation grant rounds um, with Howick, Franklin, Mangaree, Atahu, and Hibiscus and Bays. Uh, lastly, some projects didn't move forward as they realized they had quite a lot more work to do in, in terms of planning and to firm up the, the elements of their project. Um, so they kind of dropped out with a view to um, reapplying in the next round. So we're expecting still uh, a number of applications to come through and we're still working with those groups. So in the end, 17 stage two applications were received. Those projects were assessed by a panel of, of council staff and Sport New Zealand. Um, at the same time, local board and Manor Whenua views were captured and are shown um, as a, a summary in attachment A with this report. Um, it might be a bit, of a bit of a distant memory now, but we had a workshop back in March around the recommendations and obviously um, COVID-19 hit a, a week later. Uh, so since then, um, We've been re-evaluating re the projects in respect to um, the financial implications um, and a number of recommendations have changed in this report from what was workshop back in March. Sorry, I'm just getting a drink. Okay, so in terms of recommendations, um, I'd like to refer you to table two in the report. Uh, this table details the 11 community-led projects uh, that are re recommended to receive funding, which totals 4.2 million. Um, when delivered, these projects will have leveraged in excess of $5 million from other funding sources, which aligns um, with the partnership outcomes we were hoping to achieve in terms of maximising the available budget and to get more Aucklanders more active. Um, those recommendations are A1 to A11 in the report. Um, now I'll draw your attention to table three, which is the summary of council-led projects. So a number of um, expressions of interest were received from community groups who use council assets to deliver their sport. Um, these recommendations, which is recommendation B in your report, total 5.7 million. They are aligned to the sport investment plan, um, particularly in respect of addressing network um, equity issues and um, taking an outcome-focused approach. The implication of this recommendation led to recommendation C in your report, which is to convert um, the, that element of the funding from OPEX to CAPEX to ensure that fields can be maintained. Um, in terms of recommendations, the last thing I want to draw your attention to is table four, which is the deferred projects. Um, there are a number of projects that were unable to be recommended for funding as we sit here today. Um, they do align with the, with the, um, with the grant criteria, um, but in some cases they are waiting on other funding applications or looking at staging their project. Um, that situation might change before the next funding round. So uh, essentially what we're requesting through recommendation E is to bring those projects back to the committee through a short report if they progress sufficiently so that we can be a bit more agile in our response to the community. Okay, final slide. Um, so this is just to touch on the, the drawdown of funding. Uh, this is table six in your report on, <laughs> under financial implications. So I just wanted to provide some clarity here as you'll see the total investment that we've recommended to allocate is 9.9 .9 million, but the budget in FY21 is only 6.5 million. So this is because council often plays a role in providing cornerstone funding for community-led facility development projects. 
So this is the catalyst that allows, enables groups to leverage that third party funding. Um, so council's funding agreements require groups to secure all their project funds before, they, before any funding can be drawn down. This means that some projects will not require funding for at least a year or two. Through that time, they may also need time to, to go through design and consenting processes. So based on estimates about when projects will actually require funding, um, uh, the estimated drawdown in this financial year is only 1.3 million, um, which is um, significantly lower than the, the 6.5 available. So we're looking to take a multi-year prog program approach to, to this fund. Um, and that essentially the commitment is that no um, funding drawdown will not exceed the budget available in any, in any given year. Uh, finally, the, just to draw your attention to the, the fact that the large budget shown in FY 22 and 23 are only reflective of the fact that funding rounds for those haven't opened yet. Um, so those funds will be allocated and that will, that will be reduced. Neil, I just want to acknowledge the work that, that, that you and the team have done in regards to this particular item. Dave, as you as well. Um, because it's just massive and in light of COVID-19, this is one of the key things, I believe, this particular item around helping um, our sports uh, uh, and, and, and the joint approach that we have. So I know there's going to be several questions. Um, so I'm going to start off with Councillor um, Watson. Questions only, please. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, yeah, so so I'm 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 happy enough with the the ones that have uh, been recommended, um, particularly the Mangary Centre, which is a um, you know well used facility out there. Um, my question, however, though, is not with the ones that have been recommended. It, it's this rather unusual situation that that's outlined in points 44 to 48 that has emerged with the wasp hanger out in Hobsonville. And um, in the last 24 hours, I've been looking, going through the documentation that has been put out by our own sports and rec staff and a, a series of reports, not least of which is the one to the um, Upper Harbour local board in 19th of March, all essentially, which all ticked the boxes. You know, the identified need, um, the, the kind of financial model, the fact that this building's already there, uh, and the, the relative fit-out costs in the scheme of things are as cheap as it gets if we're looking at an indoor court facility. So my, my, my first question, Mr Chair, then is um, really uh, what has brought about this dramatic reversal where everything was proceeding um, along and, and with funding, you know, the local boards are in there with their funding too, and we don't have just a deferral, we have um, a recommendation um, not, not, you know, not to proceed at all. So, I, I, um, so my first question there, Mr Chair, is A, this has been ticking all the boxes for quite some time, so why on earth do we have this dramatic reversal at, at this point? Okay, so through the chat, um, the I guess the, the challenge around the wasp hanger, um, obviously at the back of the emergency budget, there was a decision to to sell that piece of land um, to to Kayunga for development. Um, the the money that Panuku had available, so that whilst there's a shell of a building there, it's missing quite a lot of pieces. So um, in terms of like service connections um, and the cost of those upgrades is actually in, a, in around eight to nine hundred thousand dollars. Um, so that was Panuku's commitment as, um, to, to the project. In addition to that, the, the local board's half a million dollars was going to be required, um, plus an, an additional investment that would likely have been around $600,000 from the Sport and Rec Facility Investment Fund, and also around $200,000 to purchase equipment um, to sit in that space from um, the active recreation budget. So unfortunately, Panuku have lost the 800,000 that, that was indicatively allocated to, to make the building fit for purpose so that the fit out could take place. And the equipment budget that was um, available was also not there anymore. So essentially we're a million dollars short before we even start to look at additional allocation from this fund. Um, so that, that's, that's kind of where that, that sits. But, but isn't the real reason, and you've, you've said this in, in your report, is that Paniku are, are going to sell this 
the wasp hammer to hang it to Kaingaora. That's the reason, isn't it? Yeah, they, uh, d- d- doesn't necessarily close out the opportunity fully. You know, we can have the conversation with Karen. Uh, okay, so that, that's that's what I want to turn to now is the assurances that have been given to the local board. Because, um, you know, thanks to the chair for acknowledging uh, the Upper Harbour local board, but uh, they wanted actually to be here today, but they've got their own meeting, so they couldn't. And you know, this has caused quite a degree of uh, a grief with them. So, in terms of the assurances, and I look at Panuku, uh, have said to the board. Um, we have devi- uh, advised our development partner of your interest in the wasp hanger, and as discussions progress over the coming months, we are more than happy to connect with you, uh, with them, with you to discuss potential opportunities. So, am I to believe that they are going to having owning the building to sell it to Kaingora, and then there are going to be discussions as to how we can somehow get the building back off Kaingora, having just sold it to them. That seems a little unlikely that there's going to be too much joy coming out of those discussions, isn't it? I, through the chair, I, I haven't had any conversation with Kaingora about what their intentions are with the building, so it's hard for me to comment on this. OK, so, you know, that's, that's not convincing at all. In terms of your own assurances that you've given here in this... Uh, paper to us, point 48. Staff will continue uh, engagement with Kaingora about future recreational opportunities in Hobsonville, in the Hobsonville area. Um, I'm pretty familiar with Hobsonville. I'd be very interested to know where indoor space is going to emerge out of uh, that area that's very expensive to buy land and which is filling in with houses. Yeah. Kira, thanks for that uh, question through the chair. Um, there, uh, that asset disposal has not occurred yet through P- Panuku, and so I guess it's probably a little bit preemptive to start that conversation with Kainga Ora around, uh, specifically around the wasp hanger. The, the provision through the wasp hanger uh, and through discussion with the local board was seen as an interim solution. Um, the the one local board initiative for Upper Harbour local board uh, involved indoor court provision, and there was uh, an understanding that that was likely to be uh, a slightly longer term um, provision to come online. So the the wasp hanger would have been potentially something that could have served that, that local community for a period of time until another provision comes comes about. So that, that work will still continue. I think there's also a, an opportunity once, if and when, uh, a disposal does happen, and, and that is then Kainga or a property, to have that conversation with them around their intent. The, uh, that, that broader um, precinct, I believe, is going to be uh, an area that they would like to activate. This is from conversations with Panuku, um, and I think having an activity like indoor courts that will draw people into that area might be a short-term option that Kainga or are, are interested in. Just one final question. Thank you, Mr uh, Chair, for allowing me to opportunity to pursue this. So I'm assuming you're aware of the set of principles that was passed by the governing body in terms of disposal, and that is uh, um, identified use or, or, or a use that has been um, getting investigated for some period of time. This clearly fits that bill, and right down to the, you know, the money about to be divvied up and, and the possibility of the local board to come up with more. Um, uh, Panuku are going to uh, realise a significant amount of money from the sale of the block as a whole. All the local board was asking for was this one part, this heritage building, be left out of this transaction that could be bringing council $30 million. So uh, as the sport and recreation representatives, did you make that case to to Panuku in your discussions? We, we, a, were you aware of the principle that we have voted through? And B, uh, you know, your ability to, to I guess, argue the, that corner from a sport and rec standpoint? Kira, and through the chair again, there was a conversation that was had with Panuku around the, I guess, the, the desired uh, sport and recreation outcomes that the facility would, would deliver for the community. At the stage that those conversations were having, whilst there was a, a plan to be able to uh, drive funding into the facility to be able to uh, create a, 
a community asset that would deliver really good outcomes. The, the funding was not all in place at that stage. There were a number of funding decisions that were still to occur, so we couldn't uh, categorically say that it was going to be, uh, be able to be turned into an indoor core facility. And so without that um, absolute surety, uh, the, we, we couldn't say, yeah, without, we couldn't say with absolute surety that it was going to certainly be a, a service asset that we needed for the community because we didn't, we couldn't confirm the funding at that stage. Okay, um. Th thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll reserve my right to speak to this item at the appropriate time. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Walker. So, um, I've got some questions around this um, issue too. Um, have there been options explored, given, as you mentioned, the activation of this building for recreational purposes is desirable? Um, and if there is a purchase for the, for the balance of the land, let's say it's um, Kaingarora, has, um, has the option been explored with them about making some contribution to Panuku or Auckland Council to help renovate this building? So that's another option. That is, we don't have to sell it to Kaingarora. We can retain it if there is a great case to actually activate it for the community, which then adds value to the balanced land that um, Kaying Aurora would develop, and for that matter, Hobsonville as a whole, has that option been explored? Uh, not to this point. Um, that, as I said, that we, we haven't had the conversation with Kaying Aurora so far. The conversation has been Panuku over to the point that... OK. That... So the issue that I'm raising, Mr Chair, and it follows on from the principles that Councillor Watson was elucidating. We should be exploring all options rather than the circumstance where we're making a short-term decision to bundle up, cash out, when in the medium to long term there may be a critical requirement for indoor sports facilities in the area and you've got a building that I understand is structurally sound. Is that, a, is that the case? The building is structurally sound? Uh, through the chair, there's been some earthquake strengthening, um, but there's still quite a significant uh, in investment to go before it can be fit for purpose in terms of... I, I understand the bolt-on stuff, but the building itself is structurally sound. It's had money spent on it, correct? Yep. It does, there's still um, some work to do with the large hangar doors and, and there's some water coming into the building, so there's still some elements to address. OK. So the question that I would put to you, um, Mr Chair, is... Is there the possibility around the consideration of these um, um, items to have a, um, an amendment that might be along the lines that um, I'm putting, where some other options be explored to retain the uh, WASP hangar um, for the purposes, um, amongst others, of um, recreation for the, um, for the wider uh, area, with the possibility of um, funding from other sources. So would an amendment like that be appropriate, Mr Chair? I'm going to ask the, the question around that because I don't like the fact around where, where there's other uh, funding uh, uh, that's available because of, of, of all the tight budgets. But David and Neil, I'll be interested to find out around um, whether there is a poss possibility of exploring options, not, not committing any funds at all. And I don't want that mentioned in, in any of the recommendations around um, commitment, uh, whether it be extra funding outside or it has to be done um, within the existing budgets, because that'll be put pressure on all the others. So, so Dave, I'd, I'll be interested to find out around exploring the options. That's the only one, and, and I need to talk to Councillor um, Henderson, who seconds this particular item, around exploring the options and, and, and whether there's any issues that I need to be aware of but before even allowing it to, 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 to be part of the recommendation. So, Dave, I, I, I'm looking for your advice. Mr Chair? 
I've got another if, related question. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll get this response first because that'll dictate where we move from here in regards to any amendment or including it into the agenda and, and the recommendations. Thank you, Dave. And then I'll go back to, to you, Councillor Walker. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, certainly we could, we could include a, uh, a stream of work where we would continue investigation with, with Panuku and with Kainga Ora around uh, alternative options at the site. And, and I think having that, that ability to do that, that's fine. Providing, I think, and I always have to go back to Councillor Simpson and, and Henderson's um, committee, as always, I know that work costs money. But, I mean, this is why I've asked if, if, if that can be done. Well, then I've got no problems at, at least having that guide in regards to, to you saying, hey, look, we, we can look at um, the, that particular option. It may not need to be in there because I trust you both and, and, and that the work would, will be done by talking um, with Panuku and Pang Ora uh, around the option. So, yeah, thank you. Um, so there's a related question first from Councillor Walker and then yourself, Councillor Just, just a seconder, I'll be asking the question, but yeah. when okay. you give me the floor. Yeah. So I have a related question and that's around applying the points listed 95 to 99. Okay which go to the application of tax credits laterally to a product like this. So this is a question that goes further to, to this option. So let's say there is a charitable trust in place that would be carrying out these works. And let's say that it can avail itself, as you've pointed out in this report, for tax credits. And those tax credits could go to um, the likes of Kaying Aurora or Panuku. Panuku is a limited company, for example. Um, have we explored those options? So we're looking at a way, quite laterally, that enables us to fill our objectives with a minimal amount of outlay. Have we explored those options? Kira, and uh, through the chair, noting on not the financial expert here. Uh, so the, the tax benefit is to uh, Auckland Council as uh, the organisation that is granting money to uh, an external uh, agency for the, the um, well, a registered charity in a lot of cases. And so we, we can receive a, a tax benefit for that. Uh, we haven't had the conversation with external parties around their role in terms of granting funds to uh, a third party as well. There are a number of organisations that are set up there, set up with a, um, a philanthropic purpose, um, Foundation North New Zealand Community Trust that grant to, to community groups on a regular basis. But and, and we work closely with them. We have regular conversations with those sort of organisations. But around other sort of uh, agencies like uh, Panuku or Kaingora, no, we haven't had those conversations. So I understand that, Mr Chair. Um, my understanding is that the tax benefit could equally apply to uh, Panuku. Um, it could uh, apply. So I'm suggesting that there's an opportunity for Council to apply itself laterally consider a number of things which might mean that the overall cost to council was minimal and we could deliver an outstanding community um, asset which would also meet the requirements of reserve contributions through development contributions for the area and noting as well that this area is experiencing huge growth and is very deficient in indoor facilities. So okay, again, I, I, I come back to you around that question around I, an amendment, Mr Chair. I, 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 as I just said, uh, Councillor Walker, and, and, and this is why I'm going to talk about um, with, with Councillor Henderson, I don't think it needs an amendment. You have got um, the, the, the staff here, Dave and Neil, saying that, yes, we will explore the options. They've heard you. I just don't think we need to put a resolution in there. Um, because I obviously, like everybody around this table, trust the staff to do the work. I've, I've, even the general manager, um, uh, Mace Ward, has, has indicated as well that those options, as, as you've specified, will be carried out. Councillor Henderson. I have one last question, Mr Chair. Your last one. And that is really just a point. That in an instance such as this, there's a that the ward councillors be in the loop as to what's going on. That would be really constructive. 
Yeah, no problems at all, and it was raised in an in, in, in earlier item in regards to that by Councillor Cooper, so rest assured that will be done. Um, and Councillor Henderson, um, there's not going to be any change, changes to the amendments. Um, Dave and, and Neil have, have, have indicated and, and said no, no issue at all in regards to getting and exploring those options. So, Councillor Henderson. Yeah, I was going to say just as seconder, and I'll, I'll just say it anyway, that I wouldn't have supported a change to the amendment anyway. Um, and for the pure fact, look, I have to be frank about this. Paragraph 46 here, being put up for asset disposal by Panuku to meet emergency budget targets. As Deputy Chair of Finance, I can't support that. Yeah. So thank you for your ruling. Yeah, so, so that's why we've just left it for the staff because they, those are the issues that we had explored earlier around, look, we don't want to commit anything in regards to this to your committee, you and Councillor Des Desley Simpson's committee because you'll have enough on your hands already. So, yeah. Now, Kapai, are there any other further questions? If not, sorry, um, Deputy Mayor. Very quick, well, I should have asked them before offline. Um, the... Um What's it called? The, 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 the horse thing. Woodhill Sands? They got the resource consent go through for that work, so I presume, to enable us. Through the chair, yes. Oh, just one question. Of course. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted some clarification because my understanding was that staff are working through with Upper Harbour Local Board and they identified a spot for that indoor court facility between Hobsonville Road and. Brigham's Creek Road, rather than on, even though it's a while away, rather than on uh, Hobsonville Point. Through the chair, the, you took about the, the Ollie project? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, that was identified as being um, on Otea Valley Road at either um, the Albany Tennis Centre or the adjacent reserve next to that. Oh, so it's on the other side? Yep. Uh, no further questions. I know, Councillor Watson, you, you've, you've got a comment, so I'll go straight to you. Okay. Um, th th thank you very much, Mr Chair. And I, and I just want to reiterate my point at the start, you know, as far as the recommendations go, that, you know, I'm very supportive of the, of the um, projects that have been approved, and particularly the ones down south at, at Papatoe Recreation and at, at Mangaree, because they're undergoing heavy use. And as we heard today, that, you know, some of those local board areas don't have any sand-carpeted fields. So... The provision of that, particularly given you know the high growth of, of young sport, is really important, and I support that 100%. Unfortunately, um, the issue that I rose, which um, you know the other side of town, um, hasn't um, been addressed. And, it, and, and as much as Councillor Henderson is, uh, you know, uh, taking the high ground there of the you know the fiscal constraints, happy to have all the sales and the Unlock Henderson back into Henderson. This is an Unlock project as well, Unlock Hobsonville, and there is, there is nothing coming back to, the, to, to this area, nothing coming back to the community in terms of that investment. But th don't believe me, don't believe me, but let's see what the actual officers said about the risks of this. So the very same um, people, well, not probably not the same people, but... Um, the Sport and Rec Department, who are now recommending not to proceed, are the same people who said as the risk of this not going ahead was that there'd be a gap in the provision of sport and recreation opportunities in the northwest. The other disadvantage would be Panuka will lease the facility to another user group and the opportunity to retrofit the existing building will be lost. So the very thing that is happening is what our officers warned us as a risk of the local board not actually proceeding with this. And so that's the supreme irony, the local board trying to hold firm to addressing this gap. And I would just say, you know, some of the population dynamics here are incredible. So, for instance, we're talking about indoor facility. The growth in the ageing component of the population in Hobsonville since 2013 has been nearly 10,000 people. 10,000 Asian uh, residents just in this Hobsonville area alone. They, of course, uh, you know, are keen proponents of indoor usage, indoor sport. Panuku, um, just as recently as a few months ago, in fact, the end of March, they were saying in the report to their board that they were happy to be progressing 
this project and that what they were seeking in terms of intended outcomes were, and I quote unquote, um, a new community hub to bring the community together. This will include a recreation facility in the Wasp Hangar and a public space adjacent. So the very people that are now pulling the rug from underneath the local community and the most intense local community in Auckland in terms of population, take a walk around Hobsonville, and which is to be joined very shortly by Scott Point and Whanua Pai, you have the fastest urban growth and the proportion of people in there that would access a facility like this is probably the highest in Auckland or, or very close to it. So we haven't um, progressed this or, or, or challenged this from a sport and rec perspective as much as we could have. Okay, We have these principles that we agreed to in your committee which said that, quote unquote, council um, will give consideration to whether a property has any alternative funded future use prior to any disposal. Now, I'm not satisfied that that has occurred here at all. There is a possibility for a win-win here. You're going to get your $30 million from this block of land anyway, or close to it if they don't give it away like the Civic and uh, the West Park Marina. You're getting a big chunk of money. All they're asking for is this one old heritage building be retained for this identified community use to be fair to our sport and rec people who have recommended really strongly, couldn't have recommended any more strongly in the agenda reports leading up to this, which I have read. So, you know, due credit to the staff who've been involved in that. So they've identified the need. They're getting the rug pulled underneath them from um, Panuku in terms of this facility, and the community will be the, the loser. So we go out and we hold up places like Hobsonville as the new Auckland, you know, the way to go, and at the same time, we're not providing the community facilities that are uh, identified as having an urgent need that we agree with, that we um, leverage the local board and everyone else to come uh, a, a large way along the road to funding. We're going to get a big cheque and we can't even give a couple of crumbs off the table to fund that much needed facility. This is as cheap as you get an indoor facility in Auckland. You won't get it any cheaper than this. This, this is as good it gets. The other one is down the line, and you know, to be honest, if we're going to be honest about the Ollie, is that you know, that's some time off. So, so there's a perfect opportunity here to come in with an interim solution. That would be a test of goodwill. That would be a win-win. So we don't even have to, um, you know, commit to, 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 to long term. The fact that that isn't considered or hasn't been explored adequately or that we have these rather empty assurances, Mr Chair, from the likes of Panuku, which mean nothing, you know, not worth the paper they're written on, um, that's a little insulting. So all I would urge, and, you know, I, I have a great deal of respect for our officers that are involved in this part of Council's um, work, this is not a good look. The, the, there will be, a, you know, um, the community will be the loser. So I, I would urge that we do a lot more than we've done. And certainly, Councillor Henderson, when this item comes back yeah. to your committee, then I will be certainly examining to what extent the principles that you voted for have been adhered to. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Watson. Uh, Councillor, yeah, hold on. Let's 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 yeah no let's just let, let's keep it sort of civil because we've only got one more item and then we all, all can go down to um, the Q Theatre and have orange juice. Um, Councillor Walker, perhaps something a little bit stronger than orange juice might be in order, <laughs> not, Mr. Chair. Not, it not it for depends me. on how um, this item yeah, goes. Not for me, but okay, yep, Councillor so, Walker. So, so I think there's a real opportunity for instances like this for the officers and for council to be more collaborative, to actually think outside the square. And that particularly goes to Panuku. Uh, I mean, we talk about unlock. We had that presentation on the part of Panuku the other day talking about leveraging things and so on, so on and so forth. Here's a perfect opportunity for that. We've got a building that's largely fit for purpose, it's structurally sound, the sums of money that we're talking about are not great. You know, they're only in the hundreds of thousands when the larger development that Kayanga Aura will be putting in place in the vicinity will be in the order of hundreds of millions. Uh, and that's in respect of built form. 
So if you've got a development that is adding to the mix, that is enhancing the saleability of the surrounding land, because we know that people shifting to areas like this want recreation, they want to do stuff, that's why they shift to locations, <clears throat> And we could facilitate a charitable trust so that you've got tax write-offs on the part of Panuku or the, or the like for significant amounts of this expenditure. And you've got the collaboration from the local board to the tune of half a million dollars. Why wouldn't you explore that option? And isn't that what we're here for? To leverage things and make stuff happen? And as John has pointed out, if there's one area that's held up as a poster child in Auckland for doing things right in terms of intensification of the like, it's Hobsonville. But if you look on the ground in terms of the actual recreational opportunities there are in that area, which is exploding in terms of population, it's not great. So I would hope that the officers are, ha are happy to collaborate. I'm happy to collaborate and I know that Councillor Watson is, and the local board. So let's make this thing work and look for the positives in terms of making something happen in terms of a simplistic rejection. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you. If there's no further comments, again, I reiterated earlier, thank you, and I have no doubt at all that... Um, all our sports in this particular round, knowing that we've got the second round, uh, are also saying thank you. Dave, just before I put the recommendation, um, in a Roman numeral two, there is a change to the recommendations. Can you just uh, briefly explain the change, and then I will put the recommendation. It, it's only going from 200 to 190,000, that's all. <coughs> Yeah, Kira, thanks, uh, Mr Chairman. Um, simply, there was a, uh, a typo in the resolution in the paper that was put forward. Um, there is some funding that the entity that we're funding brings to the project, and that had not been subtracted off the total grant amount. So it's 190, not 200,000 that we'd be proposing for the grant. You know, just in the space of 30 seconds, we just saved $10,000. So that's just so cool. So I'm going to... <laughs> so I'm going to put the recommendation, all those in favour, no. against, carried. Thank you. Is it, is it possible to have a, a note added around I will have to see because we've actually uh, carried um, the motion. I'll, I'll let uh, the two boss ladies here um, get back to me with that. So thank you, gentlemen. Um, Last item on our agenda, um, and that is item 15, tree risk assessment update. So I just want to welcome uh, our staff to here, and, and, and 